Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So my plan is to give you an impression of uh, W algebras. And uh, let me first start with a vocabulary which I already put on the board. So I, I like to call the symmetry algebra of a conformal field theory vertex operator algebra. Just, this is, and you just take it as the symmetry algebra of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, it is the formulation that a mathematician uses and it is, uh, it is really just a rigorous formulation of this concept. And I will usually say for short V or A that I don't have to write the whole word. Now, um, the title of the lectures is W algebra, so I thought I'd first uh, tell you what a W algebra is. So we are given the symmetry algebra of our favorite conformal field theory, and then we, we, want to, uh, we would like to describe it in terms of generators. And so we need a notion of generating, and uh, 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 there are two notions. And we take the notion of strong generation. So we say a set of fields strongly generates our given symmetry algebra. If every field of this theory we can write as a normally ordered um, polynomial in the de iterated derivatives of these strong generators. So for example, if we go back to last uh, lecture, the westomino witten theories, they are based on, 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 a, on a, a finite dimensional Lie algebra, and the strong generators are the currents corresponding to a basis of this Lie algebra. So in this case, we would say uh, this is a W algebra of type 1, 1,111, uh, uh, as many ones as the dimension of the Lie algebra. And uh, these ones, uh, uh, they just say that the strong generators all have conformal weight 1. So more general, we can also have uh, symmetry algebras of conformal field theories that have uh, generators of higher conformal weight. And then we usually say that our given VOA, our given symmetry algebras of type W, is a W algebra of type W, H1, H2, up to Hn, if the strong generators have uh, these conformal weights. And you have seen uh, one example of this in Sylvain's lectures, namely the Virasso algebra would in this language just be a uh, or the W2 algebra. Okay. Uh, so so from, from this perspective, uh, W algebra is just another name for the symmetry algebra of a, a conformal field theory. Historically, they, they came up as a certain BRST cohomology, and this is what I will uh, plan to explain in the second half of my lectures. And... Uh, um, but, but uh, not, not necessarily every uh, symmetry algebra of a C conformal field theory can be realized in that way. Um, so at the moment, uh, W algebras and also cosets, so I will tell you what a coset is in maybe in the second lecture today, um, are currently uh, of high interest for various physics problems, uh, just because uh, one, uh, one is that uh, often one has a conformal field theory gravity or string theory correspondences. And then usually the conformal field theory is some nice type of W algebra or even a, what I call a deformable family of uh, W algebra so that you not, not only have one but a whole, say one or two or three or many parameter family. An example of this would be the one of Lorentz lectures the, the westomino witten theories, if you take this level as a continuous parameter, so then you would lose uh, this interpretation as, having, uh, as it coming from, from an action, but still you could uh, consider such types of uh, conformal field theories, then it would give you a whole one-parameter family of theories. And uh, such uh, families of theories, they, they now appear really in many context, what I said just in correspondences to string or gravity theories, string th or also uh, very excitingly as invariants of higher dimensional quantum field theories. And um, the, the, the picture is usually that, uh, um, and, and in these uh, correspondences actually uh, the VOA, the symmetry algebra, plays the fundamental role and not the conformal field theory. 
Um, and in, in, in these uh, correspondences, uh, it, 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 it's usually the case that these, uh, the VOA is attached to uh, is a certain invariant of the gauge theory, but not only the VOA, but also certain representation theories of it. And then what you usually want to do is you have basic invariants of your quantum field theories, say, and uh, you would like to uh, understand more complicated one. And the idea is to somehow glue um, uh, glue your VOAs or glue your representation, representation categories in a certain way. And this will be really the theme of my uh, lecture. So in, in some sense, uh, uh, everything that is interesting you get by extending, uh, gluing interesting examples. And uh, yeah, maybe if at, at the end, if there's time, I can uh, explain you what this gluing means in this terms of higher dimensional quantum field theories. Okay. The outline of my lectures is I will start with a few basic examples, and which is really a review of what you already have seen. And the reason I do this because I need these for constructions of more, more of richer examples. And uh, and then what we also want to do is we want to understand how, uh, I mean, what is the heart of, of a theory, the heart of a and any uh, uh, I mean of any algebraic object is uh, its representation theory. And so I will tell you how these constructions relate representation theory to each other. And of course, you learned this is exactly what you need in order to understand conformal field theories. Um, okay, so. So the basic examples are Free field algebras and Westermino Witten theories, um, the corresponding uh, vertex operator algebras are called affine vertex algebras because they are coming from the affinization of a Lie algebra. And, uh, and it turns out basically every any uh, known interesting uh, VOA can be constructed, so any uh, interesting conformal field theory can be constructed by, uh, from, from these basic examples by iterating the procedures that I will, uh, I will present. So it's, uh, in, in some sense, everything we know uh, will be covered. So the starting point is V, a vector space, let's say over C. And in principle, if, if I actually would like to replace C by any ring, if we go to deformable families, but uh, I, I will not do that for now. And then together with a bilinear form. So if you have uh, this data, you can attach to this data um, two or actually even four different VOAs. So the first one is you uh, associate to each vector in your vector space a field. Let's call it X with a superscript V. And, uh, uh, and you have to define the operator products of two such fields. And it's just, it's just given by the bilinear form of these two vectors as second order pole. So this VOA is, uh, is called the free boson or Heisenberg VOA of V uh, together with the bilinear form B. So this is um, the free boson, let's call it. Um, well, if um, B is degenerate, then this will not. Then we will just have a commutative VOA, which is a little bit boring. But I, there's no reason to forbid it at this point. So, if, so I don't require anything on B. Hmm. 
and, and practice you, you usually want it to be non-degenerate. Yeah, it's symmetric. Hmm? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah I, I meant a symmetric bilinear form. And, and yes. Uh, uh, Good. <laughs> right, the bilinear form has to be symmetric. I, I should have said this. Thank you. Um, and, uh, but I can also declare my fields to be um, fermionic. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to write. I want these fields to be bosonic fields. I can also require them to be fermionic. We like to use the letter psi for a fermion, and then and then we take the OPEs to have a first order pole given by the bilinear form, and this is called the free fermion. And then we say it is a vertex operator super algebra. You have seen this uh, free fermion in the Vestomino Witten lectures. It was also uh, denoted um, SO, we would call it now here SO of V at level one, um, be, uh, because that's the even subalgebra of this one. Um, and uh, but what we also can uh, do is. Uh, we, we can now ask that our vector space V splits into two parts, say W plus and W minus, such that the, uh, our bilinear form to restrict it to each uh, component is zero. So we, we now think about it as a symplectic uh, form on this vector space. And uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, and why do we do this? We also would like to have free field algebras, bosonic or fermionic ones, bosonic ones, where the generating fields have poles of first order, and uh, fermionic ones, where uh, the generating fields have poles of second order. Uh, and for, for this, you need a, a symplectic form. So th then we can again associate uh, to each W in W plus a field. Um, and I should say a fermionic field. Uh, let's call it chi plus of W and to W prime and W minus um, a fermionic field, which we call chi minus of W prime. And then the OPE of two such fields is now very similar to the one of the free boson. Namely, we just take the second order pole But uh, for the free boson, uh, the OPE was uh, symmetric, and here it is anti-symmetric. So if I uh, and uh, this uh, this theory is called the symplectic fermions of the. Was Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
And uh, if you wish, uh, this example and also the Heisenberg, the free boson example, are the examples of uh, Westomino-Witten theories of, uh, of a commutative Lee super algebra, of a, just of, a commut of the commutative Lee algebra V, and here, uh, the, now you, in this case, you, uh, you interpret V as, an, as a purely odd super vector space. So um, you, you just heard it mentioned that uh, one can also have westomino witten theories associated to Lee supergroups. And uh, this is the free example of that one. So in the case of the free boson and free fermion, at least I can think in the back of my mind of some simple Lagrangian, which might not be the whole story, but at least as a... Uh, ab absolutely. I should have said these free al algebras, they all have a nice Lagrangian and a li nice action. Um, that, that's perfectly fine. It, uh, I'm not just not working with them. So here, especially for for these two, I mean, they are really best to mean written theories. So that means uh, they fall into uh, last lectures. So f just for the super case, uh, you have to uh, replace your your uh, invariant bilinear form. I, I mean, it's just a super symmetric invariant bilinear form. So, um, how will it look like for the symmetric fermions? Uh, the, right. So. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I make it more simple. Can we count dimensions? Wait, it's a, a, I mean, this is a, a dimensions, just the dimension of the no, vector space. No, dimension, the dimension of the field. Oh, okay, yeah, they, they are dimension one fields, and these are dimension one half fields. And uh, so the Lagrangian, uh, I would not be able to express in terms of this chi plus and chi minus. I would have uh, introduced extra fields whose derivatives are chi plus and chi minus and the Lagrangian would be expressed in terms of those. So the Lagrangian would be of the type um, uh, derivative of, let's call it, um, I don't know, uh, F plus, uh, something like this, where, um, where uh, uh, well, actually, I, I, I can, uh, well, the Lagrangian, uh, um, I can express it. The Lagrangian would just be something of, of this type. Okay, I should be careful. Um, you, you would introduce fields whose derivatives are the chi plus and chi minus, and then it would just be a free Lag the Lagrangian of a free field theory. Because these are fermionic fields, so if I change the order, yeah. I... This ah, B is anti-symmetric now, the two uh, Yeah, uh, uh, right, um, yes. If the space B uh, were spanned dimensional, then B is just a simple matrix. Is a yes, ma'am. And uh, just, just to complete the free field algebras, uh, I can now replace the chi plus chi minus by bosonic fields, but now instead of requiring them to have dimension one, I require them to have dimension one half, and I get the symplectic boson, VOA. And uh, that completes then the, the four free field algebras. So um, same as before, but now as associate bosonic fields. Uh, let's call them, I like to call them beta and gamma, beta of W and gamma of W prime, with the same notation as here, with no OPE. Just the first order pro pole. And these are called the symplectic bosons. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, okay. So what the upshot is just, <coughs> yes? Things with their own statistics, ghosts. 
Yes, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, of, of course, we, uh, we, we like to have uh, bosonic fields to have even spin and fermionic spin, fermionic fields to have odd spin. And so you would say the symplectic fermions are fermions with wrong statistics and the symplectic bosons are bosons with wrong statistics. Absolutely, that's, that's the way you would like to phrase it. Any more questions? So uh, the upshot here is uh, just, uh, we just need a vector space, a bilinear form, and we already get basic, of course, very easy theories. But uh, we, we need them um, uh, to construct uh, more complicated ones. And uh, especially, you already mentioned the uh, word ghost, and what do we need ghost for? For some gauge fixing. So this will be uh, the, the point. You get interesting now theories by, uh, by certain BRST cohomologies. And we, we, need, we, use, we need to have this, this ghost to, to implement our gauge fixing. So. Okay. But I, probably I will only come to that uh, tomorrow. So what I will now, uh, I now want to go to the second point, constructions and representations. So there are essentially five basic constructions, uh, though they all go under the same theme, because what can I do if I have a, a given theory? Of course, I can take the tensor product, just a, a few copies of different theories, but that's a trivial construction. So what, what else can I do? I can try to extend my theory. So we had seen uh, examples of that yesterday. For example, uh, what was it? SU2 at level four, if you extend it by its simple current, this, this, uh, the, 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 which corresponds to the, in that case to the five-dimensional representation of SU2, then this extension becomes all of a sudden the Westermino-Witten <coughs> bless you, the Westermino -Witten theory of SU3 at level one. So, so that's, that's a, a nice uh, thing, and uh, uh, you should think it's a good thing because a priori, the higher the rank of the Lie algebra, the more complicated your theory. Uh, so extension is one thing. Another thing is the opposite. Instead of inst extension, I, I look at subalgebras in an interesting way. And, and, and there one has various options. So the probably richest one is called coset. And so I will come to that. And then there are variants of that, um, which uh, I will also explain. Um, but I want to start first with extensions. And For this, uh, I should have uh, so some introductory words. Um, for me, the best way uh, to think about all these things is in terms of, of categories, uh, just the uh, representation categories. So Niels will also talk about these concepts in his lectures. I will not say much about categories. I know you're almost all physicists, so I will not say much about it. Uh, uh, I, but um, what I want to say is that this is an e extremely efficient and actually f uh, fairly easy way to think about it. Um, really, um, the point is uh, you, you take a VUA, you take a category of representations, now you hope that you are somehow able to prove that it has all the nice properties physics requires it has to have. And so what are the nice properties? This is uh, what Sylvang uh, explained. Oops. What Sylvang explained, uh, you, 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 what do you want? You, uh, you want, of course, uh, to know um, uh, what kind of objects you, do you have, what kind of modules uh, uh, you have, whether these are completely reducible, um, or if not, how they decompose. But you also want to know whether there is, for example, a tensor product structure on this, uh, on this category of modules. And uh, you want to know whether this uh, 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 satisfies certain properties. Most importantly, you would like this tensor product to be commutative up to isomorphism. So why do I say up to isomorphism? The tensor product, you think, is, is defined in terms of the fields. So you have a module one, you have a module two inserted at a certain point, and now you would like to move one field around the other, which would change the order of your tensor product. 
And but what happens if you feel it take one field once around another uh, field? Usually, uh, it, it changes, say, by a phase or so. It, it gets some monotony. And uh, as, uh, but but it's it's nonetheless still um, isomorphic. And uh, so uh, so what I want to say is the tensor product in a in, in a conformal field theory is by construction usually um, commutative up to isomorphism, but not strictly commutative. The tensor product of A, module A, and module B is not equal to module, uh, the tensor product of module B with module A, but it's just isomorphic. And this is highly important uh, um, and actually even very good because uh, as uh, uh, it's... Um, because, for example, the Verlinde's formula uh, is true precisely because this tensor product is as non-commutative non as possible in this sense. Uh, if, uh, uh, this, this is the, the, the secret reason why uh, Verlinde's formula kind of works. Anyway, um, um, the, the problem is um, it's extremely difficult to show to honestly uh, show that a given VO representation category uh, satisfies that, uh, the properties that ensure the existence of a tensor category. And especially... Uh, Sorry, these words, they are not going through. Which words? They all the category something. We don't know what they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe it is a, for the more important remarks, if you could just write them on the board, that would be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I, I only wanted, uh, what I want you to understand is that uh, there's something very subtle going on, uh, very uh, difficult uh, to do. But on the other hand, an, a physicist would always say, a priori, this is a given thing. It has to be there. This is always the physics assumption. <laughs> the, um, and um, and uh, uh, maybe I can write down a theorem um, well, it would also I'll just be words, so maybe I don't. Uh, so the, the, these ideas came actually up uh, with ideas by Verlinde, Moore, and uh, Zyberg, who, who I kind of understand that the, the physics of conformal field theory implies this tensor category structure. And it, it took then E.G. Wang uh, almost 20 years to formalize it just to say, tell you how uh, difficult this is. And uh, his final result is a theorem to, to uh, saying, uh, saying that uh, if a given VOA satisfies certain four finiteness assumptions, one of them being rationality that we already heard, then everything is okay. Then the theory is physically reasonable. And uh, so... Sorry, uh, then what happens? So if there, if if these four finiteness assumptions are satisfied, and the, these assumptions are that there are only finitely many inequivalent simple representations, that's the rationality assumption, and then um, that a, a certain quotient space is finite dimensional, it's called the C2 quotient, then um, the, the theory has to be simple, the, the symmetry algebra has to be simple as a module for itself, and it has to be of conformal field theory type, which means essentially it has a vacuum. So, and, and, and then what happens? And then, uh, then the representation category is physically reasonable. So that, that's, and, and especially Valin's formula, for example, is true. Okay? So, and uh, everything I'm uh, telling you from now on is a theorem as long as the VUA is physically reasonable. So that's is the point. And, uh, okay. So how do we, let, let, me, let, you, let me give you a classical example of, uh, represent, uh, of extensions which you probably have uh, seen in, in your undergraduate courses. So just the, the problem of ring extensions. Just, uh, let's say, commutative rings. Okay, it's a, a, a ring as a, 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 a,
Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we can also take a group, yeah, sure. Hmm? Okay. And, okay, and, and, and let M, M and N be um, two uh, R modules. So then in ring theory or in group theory, there's a concept of base change. And, uh, uh, and the base change is... So I don't know what is an R module. It's, it's, an, it's a module for the ring or for the group. It's a representation. A module is a representation. Uh, so uh, given two representations for, for a subring of a bigger ring. And I, I, I want uh, to replace after, uh, you, you sh I, I think about the rings as classical analogs or uh, toy examples for, for vertex algebras, for the symmetry algebras of our conformal field theory. And, uh, and I'm writing this down because uh, uh, base change in rings uh, for rings is uh, a very similar concept as VOA extensions. And then, but here can, you can, uh, uh, for example, um, what we can do is here we can just uh, take R to be C and S to be polynomial ring in one variable to make it concrete. And, uh, uh, of course, not very exciting rings, but uh, still. So uh, um, the, the point is you, you uh, can... Uh, uh, base change uh, maps in a module for the smaller ring to a module for the bigger ring by just taking the tensor product. The bigger ring is, of course, also a module for the smaller ring. Right? It carries, uh, I mean, polynomials carry an action by multiplication by the complex numbers. And so, um, uh, so the bigger module becomes, a, I mean, the, the mo R module becomes a module for the bigger uh, ring just by taking the tensor product of the bigger ring of, over R with this module. Can you, just for this one example, can you write that right now in all the tedious details which uh, maybe would have to be helpful? So uh, let's just take C and the polynomial over C, then yeah. we have two R modules, maybe you can Yeah, you, uh, really what it means is you, uh, you, you um, and you now uh, view your R module as an S module. Which would mean that you're allowed to multiply with polynomials from the complex numbers in your example. In your example, Yeah, for example, yeah, so you can uh, just uh, take uh, M to be uh, uh, C itself, I mean, it's, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, um, it, it would just... Uh, and S are polynomials, and it, uh, now, um, um, I mean, a, a basis, let's see, a, a basis for the complex numbers is just the num number one, for example. And, uh, but the number one is uh, also a, a basis for, for the polynomial ring as, as a module for the polynomial ring, right? Because every polynomial you can get by multiplying one with the polynomial. So that, that's kind of the base change here. And uh, similarly, uh, well, similarly, you can do this with morphisms. What is funny in time the It's the tensor product as an R module. And you can, you can uh, um, So it's in the case of the tensor of the complex numbers, that's what? Just the tensor product as a, just the ordinary term, yeah. Sorry, question. Yeah. Can S on this tensor product by multiplying the S factors? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Especially uh, now. Also, if you have a, a morphism, just a homomorphism uh, from one module to another, then you can also uh, map this to a morphism um, just by taking the tensor product of the, ident uh, the identity on on S times this morphism of M uh, on, on on M. Gives, uh, maps this morphism uh, to, 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 to an S morphism. Uh, I mean, an, an morphism of S modules. Yes? Do R and S need to be used? Hmm? Do R and S need to be used? No. Okay. Mm, but at the very least, R should belong to the center of S. 
if you want to communicate. Can, can you say it again? So do R and S need to be commuted? No, no, you should say the question. Yeah, uh, uh, no, R and S don't need to be commutative. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, I thought you, you were more familiar with this. I, I thought uh, I can take this as a, a good analogy. Um, uh, um, this is just a, con a standard a concept in ring theory and group theory. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this. So um, the, the, the point is, um, you have, let, let's say it uh, the following way. The point is you have one algebraic, algebraic structure, R, and a bigger one, S. R is contained in S. And uh, now there's a, the concept of base change. And, it, uh, and, and the important thing is there's a functor. The base change is a functor that maps a, a module, for an R module. It is, it's a map that maps R modules to S modules. And morphisms, R homomorphisms, ring homomorphisms, group homomorphisms, uh, uh, to, to, to group homomorphisms. And the, the main point is this, uh, uh, this map is, uh, respects the tensor structure. What this means is if I first take the tensor product of two R modules and then do base change, it's the same as uh, doing first the base change of the two modules and then uh, doing the tensor product as objects for the bigger one. Okay? And uh, so this is a classical algebra statement. And the interesting thing is that a similar type of thing also works for VOAs. So I will give examples, and uh, we, we will uh, see explicitly a little bit how this works, OK? Um, uh, let me just write down it uh, respects tensor product in the following way. So you, um, I can take the two tensor product of two modules for my smaller structure, and then do the base change. And the important thing, this is the same as, uh, as doing base change for my, for, for my two modules, and then taking the tensor product. So in, in this, and the, the point of the statement is this works for rings, this works for groups, it also works for vertex algebras. And, and this makes it so important because a, a structure that is so horribly difficult to get for vertex algebras is already the fusion ring. And um, I will now rewrite the statements just by replacing ring by vertex algebra, okay? And, uh, Yes? Do you want to say what the interpretation of the tensor product is in the CFT case? Um, what, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean? It has to do with fusion. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the, um, right, the tensor product is essentially the fusion product. Uh, so which the R or the S? Uh, yeah, um, let, let me write down uh, the next. Uh, uh, um, and now. Um, we, we do the, uh, the same thing again. But now let V and W be not rings anymore, but two symmetry algebras of two conformal field theories that are contained in each other. And then uh, there is also a base change. So uh, namely, uh, and now let's, let's assume that W is a direct sum of, uh, and, and these are modules for, for the smaller VOA. Let's say they are all simple. What? So when I write V without any symbol on it, this is an algebra or a representation? 
this is the, the algebra, part, the vertex algebra. Yeah, and the algebra of, uh, is is uh, uh, is of course uh, a representation for itself. So, okay, and and uh, now uh, if we have a bigger one, then this is some representation for the smaller one. For example, a direct sum of simples. So let's let's do this concrete. We had um, S U three at level one is equal to S U two at level four. Plus, um, how did you denote the weights? I wrote M2 for the spin 2 representation. M2 plus M2, okay. This is a concrete example that we had in the last lecture. And, um, uh, yeah, let, why don't we do then uh, this example and then have a break? Uh, so, uh, so the general concept is now that um, given a V module M, uh, then, um, then W fusion product as a V module, so this is fusion product as you learned it in the last lectures, uh, with M uh, is, a, is a W module. But there's one subtlety which I will maybe come to after the, uh, the break. Just uh, um, okay. So, so this is the this is the base change for W algebra. As you see, if, if I look at these formulas, I replaced my tensor over R by tensor over V O A V, and tensor means fusion. No. Okay, and uh, the the point is that this product is uh, monoidal, so for, uh, let's uh, take an example. For example, uh, let's, let's take uh, um, SU3 at level one, fusion product as an SU2 module with the module M1 half, and uh, then what is this? This, this is, um, we write down uh, SU3 level one explicitly as, a, as, a, as an SU, uh, SU2 module. And uh, we learned in the last lecture that this is a simple current. Um, so first of all, the tensor product of the, the VOA itself is of course just the module back. It's the tensor identity. And this one, and this one gives m three half. Okay, and uh, uh, so so this means this gives me a concrete map from SU two modules to um, SU three modules, and this map is uh, has very rich structural properties. So the fancy word for it is a functor, but I will just tell you what the properties are. And so the main properties are, for example, let, let me just do this one example. We, we know that, uh, um, uh, the fusion product of M1 half with uh, the spin half representation with itself is, um, is just uh, the VOA itself together with the spin one representation. <laughs> so this is a special case of the formula written down yesterday. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, and now, um, and, and now that this base change respects uh, the tensor product, uh, uh, tells me, uh, me that I can now uh, take this tensor product, induce this to an SU3 module, and uh, it, it gives me uh, the, uh, it's the, the, uh, the, the, the same uh, as the tensor product by first inducing and then taking the tensor product as SU3 modules. Okay, and actually the formulas get a little bit uh, long. Um, um, let's see. Uh,
so I, I, uh, I give this um, base change an, uh, a, a name, so I call it the base change, or the induction is maybe a good word, the induction of M1 half. And um, um, the important property of this is that this induction has the property that the fusion product as SU3 modules of these induced modules is the same as the induction of the fusion product as SU2 modules of these two spin half representations, so which we just computed here. And uh, this in base change, uh, and, and so the induction just of SU2 is SU3. If you mean M1 half, you mean the last time you were not M3 half? I meant, uh, yeah. This is M1, the next. SU2 never was M1. M1, yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So, so this this is um, may, maybe a, a, a good example. So, what we can do is so from the lectures we already know um, the fusion rules of SU two. We don't know yet the ones of SU three. And I'm now telling you, well, we have base change. Base change has the nice property that it commutes with fusion product. So we already know, for example, the fusion product of these two SU three modules. Okay. So uh, let, let's have a break now. And afterwards, unfortunately, I have to tell you a very tricky subtlety, um, because we also have to ensure that modules are local. But I will do this after the break.